Good evening and welcome to Bogaiski Hour. I hope that you all had a restful and enjoyable summer. It is good for me to be back in Tirana to examine important global and local developments that affect the lives of all Albanians, both inside the country and outside Albania. I will be answering questions from our studio audience and also asking tough questions with an important political personality. And our guest today on the Bogaiski hot seat is Philip Rika, the United States Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. But first I'll give you my overview of America's perspective on the world. What is Washington thinking? My topic this evening is America's election focus. Following the Republican and Democratic national conventions, the US presidential elections have moved into higher gear. The content of the conventions and Romney's choice for his presidential running mate demonstrates that the elections will be won or lost over economic policy. Meanwhile, foreign affairs will take a back seat. American voters will base their decisions on who they believe will be the most credible candidate in reviving the sluggish American economy. Romney's vice presidential choice, Paul Ryan, the budget committee chairman in the US House of Representatives, has voiced his plans to reduce federal spending and the national debt. His selection is intended to achieve two objectives, to focus the election campaign on fiscal responsibility and to win votes in the American heartland. Republicans calculate that Ryan's nomination will highlight the difference between President Obama's allegedly irresponsible spending plans and Romney's focus on cutting deficits while stimulating business. Ryan's budget plan would transform Medicare and Medicaid, two of the most expensive federal budget items, from a government-run program to one that gives pensioners a choice to purchase health insurance from private insurers. Democrats assert that this will force people to pay more for health care and they depict the Republicans as out of touch with ordinary voters while favoring the wealthy through new tax benefits, a policy that they say will not revive the economy or create jobs. Republicans in turn claim that reforming government entitlements is essential to reduce the deficit and the national debt or the financial consequences will prove disastrous. Ryan himself has three credentials that could work in Romney's favor. First, he represents one of the key battleground states, Wisconsin, where public opinion polls show Romney trailing Obama. His selection can turn Romney skeptics into Ryan voters in several other ba battleground states. Second, Ryan will probably energize fiscal conservatives and independent voters who are not fully convinced by Romney's qualifications but admire the congressman for his budgetary efforts. Ryan's third attribute is his conservative Catholicism and his traditional views on marriage, family, and abortion that can shore up the Republican Christian conservative base. Neither Romney nor Ryan can claim any significant foreign policy experience. Republicans calculate that international affairs will be a secondary issue in the campaign unless there is a major confrontation in a region where the US has vital strategic interests. Obama will depict Romney as inexperienced and provocative in foreign affairs, while Romney will paint Obama as weak on national defense and insufficiently tough with dictatorships in Iran and Russia. The president will claim major successes in killing Osama bin Laden and withdrawing American forces from Iraq and Afghanistan. And he will only be seriously questioned on foreign policy if an international crisis develops during the course of the election campaign.
It is time for the Bogaisky hot seat, and our guest today is the U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, Philip Rika. Welcome to the show, Philip. Thank uh, you. Guys. Thank you for making the time during your busy schedule in not just in Tirana but throughout Albania. It's a pleasure. Just a little background on the ambassador for our audience. Uh, Phil is responsible at the State Department for U.S. relations with the entire region. In other words, not just with Albania, but Bosnia Herzegovina, Croatia, Kosovo, Macedonia, Montenegro, and Serbia. Uh, he has also served as U.S. ambassador to Macedonia and has extensive and in-depth experience throughout the Western Balkans. So let us jump straight into the questions, Phil. Sure. And let me begin actually with the broader region and then we can zero in a little bit on Albania. Uh, what would you say are the core U.S. priorities in this region? I think it's, it's fairly straightforward. We want to see this region integrated uh, into a Europe which is whole, free, democratic, at peace and increasingly prosperous. That has been, of course, our goal uh, in U.S. foreign policy for Europe since World War II. Uh, it's been shared by uh, presidents and secretaries of state from both political parties over many years. And we've made great strides in that realm. Uh, if you look at uh, the enlargement of NATO, which is an open door for new members, including Albania. Uh, if you look at the European Union and our efforts to work with our European partners to uh, bring these countries in to help them with the reforms necessary to become candidates for EU membership and then the difficult path through accession to join the European Union and we've seen that in uh, Slovenia of course but uh, by this time next year Croatia, Croatia will be a full member of the EU and there's a European perspective for all the countries of the Western Balkans so that's very much uh, our policy our goals uh, we have uh, strong relationships here we have uh, embassies staffed with uh, excellent diplomats uh, and we very much appreciate our relationships with each of the countries in the region. And what would you say, looking at the region, particularly as you're, you've been here for many years, you understand many of the, the problems, the challenges, what would you say are still the outstanding challenges to be resolved, threats to be overcome? Um, I don't want you necessarily to go into worst case scenarios, but what are the sort of still unresolved issues in this region? I think all of the countries in the region are still consolidating democracy. Uh, focusing on building the institutions uh, that are necessary for successful free market uh, democracy and that's something that takes time if you look back over the past two decades the progress has really been extraordinary mm -hmm. uh, and being here in Albania during this centennial year when you think uh, of one century a hundred years of Albania's independence mm -hmm. uh, to think of what has been accomplished uh, just since the end of the Hoxha era is really quite uh, remarkable. Uh, there is still much work to be done, and the path towards Europe, towards EU membership, uh, very much lays that out. Uh, reforms that are def well defined uh, through the European perspective, uh, particularly in the area of rule of law, mm -hmm. uh, in the area of judiciary. Uh, these are critical uh, institutions uh, that involve reform, revolve a new way of thinking for many people of the region. It's something we, through our assistance programs, have tried to continue to uh, work on with these countries, and it will continue to take time. Is it a sort of generational question, would you say, to some degree? In other words, uh, the younger generation has no experience of the old communist period, is more familiar with democratic values with the West and so forth. Presumably that's the generation that will, uh, let's say, consolidate all the, all the uh, progress that this country, these countries have made? I, th I think that's true to a, to a broad degree. Mm -hmm. uh, it is something that takes time, that requires new ways of thinking. And in the world in which we live today, where communication is so instantaneous, where social media uh, mm -hmm. connects people uh, like never before, uh, some of the long-held beliefs, uh, some of the mythology uh, that's been uh, peculiar to the Balkan region is slowly disappearing. Uh, and they're realizing that uh, borders can be used to unite, not to divide. That's the goal of the European Union. And if you look at what Europe has accomplished uh, since uh, the end of the Second World War, where uh, former enemies are now completely united mm -hmm. uh, economically, politically, working together uh, for standards of living, for levels of prosperity, despite 
the current challenges uh, in the global economic situation. Uh, these are levels of prosperity that were never imagined before. It's interesting, you mention how, presumably how Germans and French and Germans and Poles have managed to reconcile after these changes and are now good partners within the European Union. Do you see that happening between neighbors here? Because there are still, as you know, some outstanding disputes, to mention but a few, between Macedonia and Greece, between, even between Montenegro and Serbia, certainly between Serbia and Kosovo. Do you see these questions being resolved in the framework of accession towards the European Union, accession into the European Union? I think that's very much uh, the goal of that. And, and uh, as the other countries in, in Western Europe have demonstrated, these things can be overcome mm -hmm. uh, by taking a new approach, uh, by putting the past behind and looking uh, toward the future. Uh, this is what uh, our goal has been in terms of encouraging integration Euro-Atlantic integration. What can the United States and our European partners do for the countries of this region? We can help them make the changes necessary to be eligible and, and come into mm -hmm. uh, these institutions. It still takes a lot of work. It's not perfect. So the countries of the EU have to work together all the time. They have right. to focus on compromise. And that's a word that needs to be learned in this region. For too long in the Balkans, uh, the idea has been that uh, uh, there is only capitulation. Mm -hmm. That is not the key to success in the 21st century. Compromise, compromise can mean uh, positives for uh, both countries, for all people mm -hmm. of the region. And I think you have seen a lot of that. Uh, you see great cooperation uh, working together through uh, NATO or the Partnership for Peace, through structures like uh, the Adriatic, the A5, uh, where Countries are working together on security issues, on stability issue, where uh, through integrated border management uh, between and among countries of the region, uh, you see great progress in terms of law enforcement, uh, in terms of uh, interdicting uh, trafficking and narcotics, trafficking in human beings. Mm -hmm. These are the types of steps that are, are vitally important, and it's what our programs have been designed to support. You mentioned the European Union. What is the degree of coordination, would you say, between the United States, between Washington and Brussels in terms of its approach towards the region? We work very closely together with our European partners. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the United States is not a member of the European Union. We don't have a, a vote at the European Council or a veto. Mm -hmm. uh, but we determined long ago that uh, it was in our interest as well and the interest of uh, all of Europe, all of the transatlantic, uh, trans-European uh, space to bring these countries of the Western Balkans into these uh, institutions and so we coordinate closely. Our assistance program, the billions of dollars that the United States has invested uh, in this region uh, since the early 90s are all designed to help these countries meet the requirements and expectations to help them on the reform agenda Mm -hmm. for uh, EU membership. And of course, NATO membership uh, is a very much a part of that. NATO uh, has proved to be the most successful security alliance in human history, I think quite arguably. Uh, and you don't see NATO countries going to war with each other. Instead, you see uh, a political and security institution mm -hmm. which allows countries to resolve uh, their problems and increasingly work together uh, to deal with security threats from outside the region as well. Mm. Uh, as you know, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard expressed, there is a fear I hear among some people that America is going to withdraw, a divided Europe, an uncertain European Union is going to take over responsibility for the region. How would you address that in terms of U.S. approach now as compared to when the crisis was in the Balkans 10, 10 15 years ago? Well, I think you just look at the progress that has been made. There are still challenges, as you pointed out, uh, in this region. Uh, there are still uh, issues that need to be and should be resolved. Uh, but you don't have the threat of mm -hmm. war and, and major violence. Um, and the United States is very committed to this region. Secretary Clinton takes a great interest in this region. Uh, great personal interest. A great personal interest. Yeah. And, and uh, so has every administration. Uh, and you can see it through our presence here. Every one of the countries of the region has a major U.S. Embassy presence engaged in so many areas to, again, help our partners and friends uh, make the necessary reforms required to move forward, to achieve their goals, uh, to keep open the door of, uh, of NATO and EU membership, 
because that's what people increasingly throughout the region have said they want. They want to be a part of this Europe whole and free, uh, a part of the 21st century, not looking backwards to the horrors of the sure. late 20th century and, of course, the 19th century before that. Right. L looking now more at Albania's progress uh, towards the European Union, <coughs> I mean, you can't, nobody can give us a timeline of when Albania will be a member. Uh, but what is it? What are the priorities? What are the main things that the government has to do to, to, to qualify for accession? Well, I think the EU set out a, a very good list of recommendations, 12 recommendations that were, were needed uh, to become a full candidate, uh, mm -hmm. to achieve candidate status. Uh, and that's what the government should be focused on. Mm -hmm. uh, the time is really now. Uh, we all know uh, that there's been disappointment at mm -hmm. the pace of reforms. Mm -hmm. They slowed greatly. Uh, when politics got in the way of progress, uh, when individual agendas and, and political parties took precedence over the well-being and the future of the whole country. And now is the opportunity to make some real strides, even in the next few weeks, as EU officials have pointed out, before the European Commission issues its next yeah. progress report, uh, with the hope that Albania could achieve uh, the candidate status by the end of this year and then move forward into the very difficult process uh, necessary mm -hmm. to begin accession talks right. and ultimately, uh, as we've seen with uh, other countries uh, in the region, become full members. I'm often asked the question <coughs> regarding EU membership. By the time Albania is ready to enter, what kind of European Union will exist? I know you can't forecast, but it, the question is, how can we reassure the Albanians that it's to their benefit regardless of when they get in to pursue these reforms. It's not just a question presumably of membership, but it's good for the country to, to have these reforms completed, implemented. Well, I think uh, we've all seen what the EU has done for its member states mm -hmm. uh, in terms of not only uh, uh, consolidating peace and stability, uh, but helping uh, the countries of the European Union be competitive in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a question of markets. It's a question of competing uh, not only with North America, but increasingly with Asia mm -hmm. uh, in uh, the modern economy, which is very much interconnected. And we right. can see that uh, in the European Union itself, but right here in Albania. What happens next door economically affects what happens here. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reforms that the European Union requires uh, for membership are very much chartered to moving the country into a modern competitive economy mm -hmm. where institutions reflect uh, democratic values, uh, mm -hmm. reflect open economies, yeah. uh, and so that Albania or any other country in the region can be part of something much bigger. In, in terms of regional cooperation, you mentioned uh, how important this is, and, and there are many examples from European Union, Benelux, Visegrad, and so forth, of countries successfully cooperating. In, in the case of the West Balkans, uh, regional security, economic development, how important are things like energy security, infrastructure, uh, transportation, other regional connections? And, and can Albania play an important role in these spheres? Well, I think energy is a clearly a, a critical matter. It's important for economic growth. Uh, it has implications uh, for uh, geopolitical uh, uh, questions. It's important for security, economic security, and, and broader questions of, uh, of stability. Uh, so it's important uh, that countries think together of how they can uh, together address their energy challenges. And we see that uh, whether it's questions of uh, potential pipelines in the region that can help bring mm -hmm. energy sources here. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, countries and people have to work together. Uh, small, isolated markets are not going to be as successful as those who work together. Uh, and that's what, of course, the European Union and common markets are all about. Would you support a regional common market? There have been some, uh, some suggestions, some proposals quite recently uh, talked about in the region. Some countries would oppose it. Uh, others would support it. Do you see, uh, particularly in this part, in the Western Balkans, some sort of regional market that can enhance the v added, give added value to each country, so to speak? I think really what countries in this region should focus on is their European perspective. Mm -hmm. The course is well laid out for them. What needs to be done, uh, it's what we support, uh, is uh, the open door to NATO, the open door to European Union membership, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we've worked very closely with our European partners on and with each country in the region.
And, and, and in, in terms of this regional cooperation, you mentioned energy and infrastructure and inter, uh, communications. Should America be playing more of a role here, do you think? I think we play a, a large role. We want to make sure that markets here are open to potential U.S. investors. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to uh, encourage uh, opportunities for U.S. investors as well as investors from around the world. And that's mm -hmm. why transparency is so critical. That's why rule of law is absolutely essential. Sure. U.S. investors tell me. They come, they take a look at the region. They want to be sure that uh, their contracts are sacrosanct, mm -hmm. uh, that they have recourse to, uh, to a judicial system that is uh, fair mm -hmm. uh, and balanced, that uh, there's a level playing field. Uh, and that's, again, what the reform process is, is very much about, uh, the importance of independent institutions, independent judiciary. Uh, it's a competitive world out there, mm -hmm. and capital <coughs> will go where it is safest. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think American companies, American investors have a long history of taking a look at, uh, at uh, challenges. They're willing to uh, invest, but they have to know uh, that there is a level playing field and, and know that uh, the rule of law will prevail. Mm -hmm. let, let me ask you a, little, a couple other questions about the region. You're going to Kosovo next, I gather, to Pristina. Uh, what is the purpose of your trip there? I know it's of great interest to people in Albania. Well, I've had the opportunity to visit uh, Kosovo uh, several times uh, in the past year since I uh, assumed these responsibilities. Uh, this time I'll be going uh, to meet with the International Steering Group Mm -hmm. uh, where we expect to take a decision to end supervision of Kosovo's independence. Mm -hmm. That will mean the end of the International uh, Civilian Office. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we've already seen, uh, Kosovo's uh, uh, parliament has taken steps to approve uh, constitutional amendments and legislation necessary to take over uh, these requirements right. in line with uh, the comprehensive settlement proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's an important time for Kosovo. Uh, it shows they have made great strides in, uh, in their uh, little over four years of, of independence. Uh, but of course, there's much more to do. And uh, they will have to uh, be focused uh, and disciplined in working together in setting aside uh, petty politics and uh, individual agendas in working for uh, the, the common good of the country. And I presume part of your job is to gauge the mood and offer suggestions to different capitals in terms of regional cooperation, resolving some of the outstanding problems. I know you've been to Belgrade since Nikolic's uh, um, election. Uh, how do you see that relationship between Kosovo and Serbia? Well, I think uh, it will be important for, uh, for Serbia with its new government mm -hmm. uh, to focus on normalization. Mm -hmm. uh, of the relationship uh, and the contacts with Pristina. Uh, this is what the European Union has made very clear is going to be necessary for Serbia to take the next steps towards its goal of European Union membership. Uh, Serbia achieved candidacy status mm -hmm. uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, and in order to uh, move into the accession process, uh, Brussels has been very clear, along with member states, uh, that certain reforms are going to have to take place and there is going to need to be progress right. uh, in dialogue with, uh, with Pristina. I think that's very uh, doable. I think we saw a number of agreements that were reached through the EU-led dialogue uh, uh, earlier this year. Those agreements need to be fully implemented mm -hmm. as a very first step and then uh, look at taking the next steps uh, to come to a, a more normal situation. Last couple of questions. You served, of course, as ambassador in Macedonia. The, the name dispute, and it's actually broader than simply the name, with Greece, uh, continues to fester, and it blocks Macedonia's progress to both important institutions, NATO and the EU. Can you see any light at the end of the tunnel in resolution? I've always been able to see uh, a resolution. I've always uh, hoped for a way forward. I think it's tragic that there hasn't been uh, progress in that regard. Uh, no one more than the United States wants to see Macedonia move forward on its Euro-Atlantic agenda. Uh, at Bucharest, uh, a decision was taken. We want to see mm -hmm. Macedonia become a full member of NATO. We want to see them progress through accession talks uh, to become a member of, of the European Union. That's good for 
Greece, it's good for the region, it's mm -hmm. good for Europe and for the whole transatlantic space. So I hope that both countries will be able to work together. They have the good offices of Ambassador Nimitz uh, and the United Nations, uh, a process uh, through which uh, they can find, um, again, a compromise, a way forward uh, to see that uh, this process is unblocked. It's an important step. I think it will be a historic step, uh, and we certainly hope that it will happen. And important for Albania as well to have a, <coughs> a neighbor that's within two major Exactly, and, and I think uh, you know, it's uh, one of the issues I've stressed, one of the themes I've uh, pursued here is uh, the important role Albania has played mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a, uh, a constructive actor within the region. Um, and uh, I've encouraged the leadership here to continue to play that role. Uh, I think Albania is a, a strong friend to its neighbor Macedonia. It's a strong friend to uh, Kosovo. It can play a, a very positive role uh, diplomatically and mm -hmm. as a good friend, a good neighbor uh, and, and partner. Mm -hmm. And certainly we have a very strong, the United States has a very strong uh, partnership with Albania. We're very pleased to see Albania as a full member and ally in NATO, mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, we have a, a very strong uh, uh, commitment to each other, uh, and that is uh, whether we're serving together in Afghanistan, uh, or whether we're working together on uh, reform efforts or some of the uh, the initiatives that Ambassador mm -hmm. Arvizu has undertaken right. uh, recently to promote citizen involvement in their communities, mm -hmm. uh, to promote uh, efforts to improve uh, uh, services and, and um, lives for all the citizens in Albania. Mm -hmm. Last question, uh, 100th year anniversary of Albanian statehood. How would you sort of summarize the main drivers of that relationship, the Albanian-American relationship? Obviously with huge historical, um, let's say, anchors. Uh, how, would you, how would you describe that relationship now? What, what holds that together? Well, I think it, it's based on a longstanding uh, friendship. Uh, there's a strong diaspora of Albanians uh, in the United States. Um, we have uh, supported Albania's uh, transition, its reforms, its progress, and we want to continue to do that. And uh, we find Albania to be, uh, uh, as I said, a constructive player in the region. Mm -hmm. We want to see them do that. We also want to, as friends, uh, speak out and talk about the need to continue the reform effort, to refocus energy. Uh, to make sure that independent democratic institutions are respected, to work on judicial reforms, to uh, stress the importance of rule of law, to deal with corruption. These are the things that I think uh, average Albanians are concerned about. Uh, and this is what will take Albania uh, into new directions in its next 100 years. And we, the United States, uh, expect to be a friend in that process. Good to, we won't be around then, of course, but... Uh, <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> anyway, Phil, thanks very much for being with me and being on the show, uh, for your thoughts and insights and candor. And uh, best of luck in your important work. Hopefully have you back here next time you're coming through Tirana. Thank you, Janus. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. And see you in Washington. Okay. We will break now for a few minutes for some adverts. We have two prominent Albanian analysts to discuss U.S. policy in the light of Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Philip Rika's visit to Tirana. On my left here, I have Georgi Filippi. Georgi is an Albanian economist and research director of the Agenda Institute. He has held uh, numerous positions, uh, including in Washington at Georgetown University and the World Bank as well as in the Albanian Council of Ministers and the Ministry of European Integration. Welcome to the show, Georgi. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and on my right, and this is not a political left-right, and on <laughs> my right is Fatos Tarifa. Uh, Fatos is an old friend, uh, former Albanian ambassador to the United States. Uh, he has lectured at numerous American universities and is currently director of the Institute of Social and Policy Studies at the European University of Tirana. Welcome to my show, Fatos. Thank you, Janusz. So let me begin with, with a basic and I think very important question. Has the United States diminished its role in the Balkans to such a degree that the European Union is a more important player in this region? 
Maybe start with you, Georgie. Uh, actually, this is a this is a very important question for for all Albanians. Like, uh, which is the way that uh, the spotlight on our country and the region is uh, uh, sourced from? Is it Washington or is it is it uh, Brussels or when is both of them? And so, when are they uh, joined in their in their uh, uh, statements and? Uh, policy and when there is a, a difference between this, this right. two, these two capitals. Uh, it is uh, given the nature of, the, of both capitals, therefore both countries and both foreign policies behind, behind the capitals, it is difficult to give a very clear-cut answer because of the different nature of these two, uh, uh, we can't even call them states because it's the European Union which is a, an organization of, of, of a sort of an international organization towards becoming a, a, a state and, and, uh, and the United States of America. Uh, the Balkans have throughout history played a very important, uh, a more important than its size, uh, uh, position in the foreign policy of the big global players. This uh, has economic uh, reasons, has geopolitical reasons. It, uh, it is positioned in a in a sort of a crossroad between east and west and north and south. Uh, it's positioned in between, uh, if we may, three continents, in between Europe and Asia and, and a little bit of Africa, given the, given the recent uh, like de developments in northern Africa as well. Huh? So uh, it is very particular in uh, attracting the attention from the big global players. Now, in terms of, of U.S. Uh, versus European uh, attention mm -hmm. to the region, this uh, has changed uh, throughout the times. Like for Albania, it is very important to note in this 100th, uh, 100th anniversary of, of our country that since the very beginning, since the early days of the, of the formation of the modern Albanian state, the United States of America have, have played uh, a crucial role and mm -hmm. have have been involved in in shaping and what about and now given the new context uh, <clears throat> in terms of America's priorities Europe Europe's difficulties internal difficulties who plays the more important role here would you say but let, let, us maybe let, let me say that's a matter of, matter of perception you know? mm -hmm. if we ask an ordinary Albanian uh, the role of the United States is perceived as much more important than the role of the European Union so the same is with the, the Albanian politicians I don't uh, look much back at history and what role the United States did mm -hmm. play in Albanian independence or in political development mm -hmm. and uh, what role does the European Union actually play. Uh, but if you, uh, given the proximity of Washington and Brussels and also given the, the gravity of both capitals on Albanian politics and global politics, I'd say that the role of the United States is much more important and perceived as such among Albanians. Uh, although Albania is part of Europe, I would say geographically and culturally as well. And the Balkans uh, is uh, much in the agenda of the European Union. Still, the Balkan people and also Albanians perceive the role of the United States as a much more important and decisive, especially given the uh, role that the, the, the European Union has played in the past 20 years in the Balkans, the Euro Yugoslav crisis and the rest that we have. So America has been much more determined and is perceived as such among our people. Is it something specific, though, for the Albanians, or is it the region-wide phenomenon, would you say? Well, if you see the, the Kosovars mm -hmm. also, which now are country in their own, or the Albanian Macedonia, a very important political factor, Bosnia as well. Mm -hmm. Ask a Bosnian, sure. I would say, who is stronger and more decisive to protect their own interests, an American soldier or EU uh, soldier? I think uh, it's perceived in the Balkans as such, mm -hmm. and be because, because I hardly see that the European Union have a, a foreign policy as such. Uh, I would say that uh, they have not had, uh, say, well articulated foreign policy towards the Balkans as well. While the United States does have one because it has its national interest. Mm -hmm. would, would you agree? Uh, I would slightly disagree actually because uh, the, it's, 
as we started talking earlier uh, 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 in this conversation, it has very much to do with the role that these two actors want to give themselves. Like, oh, and the perception is similar in Albania and in other, your, uh, sorry, uh, Western Balkan countries as well, be because because of that. Like, if if we want to to make it in a very simple terms uh, uh, of of language, is the United States or or Washington is there when when it, when it's term for the stick to be used while Brussels is there when is the term for the carrot to be used. That is, that is the, sort of a, a, the sort of the impression. So basically, the, since uh, Professor Tarifa talked about intervention in Kosovo, uh, uh, it's usually the United States who was very much involved in that and is humanitarian, uh, leading the, the humanitarian intervention in 1999. But it's the European Union which, which uh, uh, had the mandate to start building uh, the, the new, the new uh, Kosovo state. It's a little Except bit I would add that the United States was at the forefront of the campaign to get Albania and other countries into NATO. Definitely. So that, that, was, that, so was a, that was a carrot that was a stick, I suppose. Yes, <laughs> yes in that case, yes, that's true. But NATO in itself is like it's an alliance for security and, and for foreign policy, while the, the development money would come from Brussels in, in, the, sen in the course of European mm -hmm. integration. That's what I uh, uh, more had in mind about that. Right. So it's a, joint, it's a joint effort. When it comes to EU foreign policy, uh, I think uh, we very easily can agree that it's lacking. But we have to define the terms because we expect the European Union to have the foreign policy of a state. It cannot. It is not a state. So mm -hmm. basically, if it is lacking, it's not something which is wrong and definitely negative for the Union because it's, this is an extra weapon that the Union can have on top of bilateral yeah. foreign policies. Right? Given that the Union is not a coherent, it's not a federation, <clears throat> it's not a United States of Europe, how would you describe uh, Obama's policy, President Obama's policy towards the European Union? How does it differ from previous administrations? Well, let me go back to the European Union foreign policy. Mm -hmm. I, I disagree, and actually strongly disagree with uh, the kind of uh, uh, policy that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, not having a national interest, the European Union does not have a foreign policy because that's the basis of foreign policy. And if you have a union in which five countries, members, do not recognize an independent state like Kosovo, mm -hmm. what kind of foreign policy can they uh, cook you know, in, in, their, in, in Brussels? Uh, coming to the Obama administration, mm -hmm. well, I personally believe that uh, the Obama administration has not been as much attentive towards the European issues and the European Union as the Bush administration was before that or the Bill Clinton administration was. And you can see that. Take away the major speeches of Obama in Cairo, in Istanbul, and Brandenburg. I don't know what other uh, dialogue Washington had with Brussels or with uh, uh, single, particular uh, capitals in the European Union countries. But towards the Balkans, again, there is no comparison you can make with the Bush administration which provided Kosovo with their independent So paradoxically, state. all the support that European Union leaders and publics had for Obama hasn't tra been tran uh, translated into a more, yes. let's say, engaged policy. Because I think it's been a rather disappointing mm -hmm. policy. W would you agree with this? But I think it's generalistic. It's not only related to Europe. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a different foreign policy in Washington overall for the, for mm -hmm. the whole global development. And, yeah, and sure. it's, a, it's a different take. It's a different level of discussion. It's a different involvement. Mm -hmm. So I think, and this, uh, I mean, the attention towards Europe and especially towards the Balkans, it's in line with the, with the overall development of the, of the foreign policy being, to use the expression of <laughs> Professor Tarifa, cooked in Washington. Right. But I think uh, uh, Europe is always perceived as the, the soft power generator. Therefore, their foreign policy is a soft kind of foreign policy. While, 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 while we cannot say the same for the United States, for right. sure. Would you so, say there's some disillusionment in Washington with the European Union performance, uh, particularly the, the, the monetary crisis, the sovereign debt crisis, the uh, uh, uncertainty whether it's going to become a political union, its, let's say, limited hard power abilities, capabilities. Would you say there's some disillusionment? Uh, I, I think you can sense some disillusionment also because of the fact that uh, uh, given the, the global developments, the latest global developments, the United States is very much seeking for an ally who thinks like mm -hmm. the United States, which has the Western perspective of development, the democratization of societies and political and institutional developments, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the prevailing model, if we want to call it, after the Cold War. The so. United States is alone in that. Uh, it's still alone, let's say, in, in, in leading this, this kind of global dance 
towards this sort of development and definitely they would appreciate their European partners which actually are very important global players in mm -hmm. this perspective to be able to act fast to be able to act clear and mm -hmm. to be able to, to, to stand by the United States I, I use the wording very carefully it's not that Europe does not uh, follow this mm -hmm. sort of dance if we want they take time it takes longer for them, they're, they're, less, they're less clear because they have to comply with the interests of 27 members there. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other side, Europe is also providing uh, an important, uh, let's say, partner for the United States when it comes to international development, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, there, is a, uh, uh, yes. there, there is a, excuse me, just to finish mm -hmm. the thought, there is a sort of coordination between the two when it comes to uh, international develop and financial assistance and there is less so in terms of overt uh, interventions mm -hmm. or uh, security or like Katis, you wanted to, to jump in? Yes, I, I want to make a clear difference. We can't talk for Europe or about Europe as a whole. Mm -hmm. I would not like to, to use the uh, Rumsfeldian language, the old and the new Europe. But uh, while Brussels represents the European Union, there are other capitals which represents uh, various uh, individual members of the European Union who have a much warmer and better relation with the United States. Great Britain, the Netherlands, Denmark, uh, within NATO, Turkey, and Norway also. So yes, Europe has friends in Europe, and uh, it's uh, the most natural ally of uh, the United States, the European Union as such. But of course, I would agree with Jerzy that uh, the focus of the US uh, foreign policy has changed, has shifted a lot mm -hmm. during the past three and a half years, four years. So it's not the same foreign policy, but basically the principles on which it is based are the same. U.S. Interest, uh, national interests and the uh, promotion of democracy. Mm -hmm. These are the two main pillars. Georgia, as, uh, as an economist, how would you say that the crisis, or well, the global economic crisis, but specifically the European sovereign debt crisis, uh, as well as America's uh, financial problems, the debt uh, cutting back on foreign expenses, and so, how has that affected, would you say, the U.S.-EU relationship? Uh, actually, this is very interesting, and, and I'm glad we're living in these interesting times because, as an economist, uh, uh, we all study in economic books that crises can 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 bring development as well mm -hmm. if they're if they're properly used and if there uh, if there is a, a positive and optimistic stance to the effect of the crisis and in there if there is a will to stand together and face them, this can be the cause for for uh, a better development. I am hoping this to be the case in the European Union. So I'm, I'm hoping for this crisis to be the reason to promote greater integration rather than less integration. And, and we're seeing some of that. I, I, mean, I mean, yesterday was uh, the day before. Thursday was a very important day for the European Union. I'm, I'm sure you have, you have followed the, the, Mr. Draghi is the head of the European Central Bank stance on buying some of the countries in difficulty sure. uh, uh, bonds. This, this is with, very with, important. With some this strict is, stipulations in terms of... With some yeah. strict stipulations. I mean, this is, this is what I meant using the crisis for better and, and, and I mean of course you have to be cautious this is this is not time for taking huge risks because this is a, 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 a the moment where the European Union is trying to develop itself further mm -hmm. uh, deeper it's it's very crucial crucially conditioned by credibility in in its institutions and therefore they have to be careful and take small steps but they have to take the steps in advance and and mr draghi's decision i think was a very important step in advance this crisis of course the european crisis of course has 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 seen the european countries to to be more national nationally or or introvertly focused that rather than 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 internationally focused and if we want this can also be said about the united states in a sort of extent as well i mean i followed mr obama's uh, uh, speech in the in, in the convention of course national policies take very much of a great priority now because these are emergency policies but i gather but you're optimistic about the future of the european union regardless of the the, the problems with the the, the the monetary union with the sovereign debt the high unemployment recession potentially throughout the eurozone but you're still optimistic about the future of the institution as uh, in in the sense of a union in the of, sense of, of in integration the sense of growing deeper exactly right? yeah, yes yes i'm definitely optimistic this is not the first time that you uh, of course this is this is a major global crisis but european union has gone through several of those uh, 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 Unfortunately, the last major one was the Second World War, which was a major, major, major crisis as well. But 
if the union uh, uh, was, was born after that big major global, uh, uh, not only crisis, but a war, I think, I think the European Union states can have the power to face this crisis, use it for their best, mm -hmm. uh, of course, with, with, some, with some losses, because, because uh, uh, compromises have to be made. But I think that the union will take this into, into a different well, stage. Some analysts contend that, that this is not just another crisis, but this is an existential test. In other words, will the European Union survive in the form it is now as a result of these major economic, but not just economic, but also social and political problems, problems of sovereignty, surrendering sovereignty. What do you think, Fatos? Will the European I, Union I, survive? I don't think so. And I wonder where come, does this optimism come? especially at this particular time in history when the European Union has proven not to be succeeding in its own ideal. Uh, the crisis is, is a tremendous one and we cannot just uh, do as if it's not happening in front of our eyes. Uh, the Eurozone is a crisis and it's uh, at the risk of uh, being dismantled. Uh, the European Union as such lacks legitimacy. Uh, we see that the EU does not have uh, a blueprint where and tell me who is the one who's going to tell me where the European Union is going to be in 10 years from now in 20 years from now they say but 2025 what is the European Union going to be uh, deepening further enlarging more we don't really see any particular policy coming from Brussels so I'm deeply pessimistic and we don't know what's going to happen with Britain people are so dissatisfied with the Union in, in London that we may see Great Britain uh, leave the Union at some time shortly. If Greece leaves the, the Eurozone, and if other countries probably are forced to leave, Portugal and Spain and Italy possibly, then what is the European Union? Uh, I am very pessimistic, and I've made that public for a long time now. Uh, the only solution to the European Union is what I think is federalization. If Europe does not become a federation like the United States, it is impossible for her to exist, let's say 10 or 15 years from now. So you cannot deepen something without having the structure and the surrender of that sovereignty you to you, a central and you, body. It's more difficult to both <coughs> deepen and enlarge further. Mm -hmm. So that is wh how I see the most difficult uh, uh, thing now with the Union. You so you're an opti <laughs> what makes you an optimist? <laughs> <laughs> you're an optimist, a rare breed at the moment. This is a little bit of a story of the chicken and the egg, if, if we want. So it's, 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 it's a little bit of a... a cause and effects analysis, sort of, let's say. I, I fully understand Professor Tarifa's stance, I, and I understand that there is many people in the world which feel so, and that is why Europe is seeing some sort of a crisis in itself. Because if we have an economic analysis of the latest developments, the euro as a, as a, as a, as a currency did not have to go through its gone, what it has gone through, if it was the currency of a single country, if we, if you, if we look at the different figures of the, of, the, of the Eurozone's economy as a whole, the attack on the currency is unjustified economically. I think the reason for that is only this uh, 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 focus, like a lot of investors, analysts in the world not understanding the Union and its developments and, and being skeptical about its continuation, that is risking the, the existence of the common currency and of the institutions. So why it's, not not of not no. it's not a matter of not understanding, yeah. it's a matter of understanding it realistically. Look, it, look at the growth rate in Europe. Take away Germany, what is the rate of Italy, mm. Belgium, Spain, all the rest of the countries compared to the United States which has come back to the two and a half, three percent yeah. annual growth. What is the, the aging problem? Tell me. What is the population of Italy going to be in 10 years, 20 years from now? Spain, Germany, they're all losing population. There are more people dying in Spain nowadays, as we speak, than people newly born. So there is a population demographic crisis, and demograph demography matters a lot. Mm -hmm. There is economic crisis, financial crisis, political crisis. We don't want to see that. Right. But it's there. It's not perceiving like a crisis. It is a crisis. It's a real one. L let, let me stop you there on the EU for the moment, because we could spend the rest of the, the, rest of the day if in, in terms of analyzing the future of the Union. Maybe a last I comment. I want to come back to the United yeah, States. I agree that, that, uh, that uh, uh, it is difficult to be so, so uh, optimistic about the Union the way the, uh, if we want to analyze it as a country. But it is a sort of an experiment. So basically, if we want to have a national ana analysis 
on this union thing. It's, it's difficult to do because this is like, it's a different level. We haven't seen that. The last time we saw it was, was the Soviet Union that is dismantled now. A, a union of economies with a one currency and Comic -Con. with different with yeah <coughs> Comic Con, so but, it's 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 it is still open. The journey is still out. But right. I wanna, well, I let, wanna let me open. come back to the region. Let mm. me come back to the Balkans, mm. where, where Albania is situated. <clears throat> Do you see any scenarios of instability, potential instability in this region that could draw the United States back in in a more pronounced way? I'm saying militarily, humanitarian ways. In other words, there are some, some, some simmering crises, not in Albania, but in neighboring countries, as we know, in Macedonia, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, in Kosovo, northern Kosovo, Greece, of course, that's another potential hotspot. So how do these affect uh, US policy, do you think, in the region? Can the US be drawn back in? I think there are three hot spots, let's say. Bosnia, which is an unresolved mm -hmm. issue. Uh, northern Kosovo, and more like the uh, replica of Macedonia 2001. These are the three, uh, re three reasons I think that may draw back the United States in the region and have her stay here for a long time. Well, presumably the European Union couldn't handle... I, I don't that. trust the European Union. Is that, is that a general view of, uh, in uh, Albanian society? You find it quite uh, widely spread. You mean in terms of conflict resolutions? Conflict specific. resolutions, especially conflict resolutions, because uh, Srebrenica w was, was a, a very good case in point. Look what happened there. And without the United States and NATO, uh, a, a bigger drama and tragedy was going to happen. I, I don't think uh, European Union is going to be a real actor playing or wanted to play. Are you optimistic about, uh, you're optimistic obviously about the future of the Union. Are you optimistic about the Union's capabilities of handling crisis? <laughs> Unfortunately, here I have to agree with Professor Tarifa. It's, uh, uh, the Union's capacities in handling crisis has not been proven to be uh, there and we don't have any success cases actually of that. Uh, to the contrary, we do have a long list of cases where the Union could have acted and it has not and it had not in time. And, and, and we also have Albanian cases of, of the Union taking longer to react and coming after the, <laughs> the conflict has uh, sort of disappeared and mm -hmm. coming with the wrong measures, sending special envoys which were never turned into envoys. And it's a, it's, it's a complex, complicated story in Europe. Yeah. So I don't, I don't expect the European Union actually to be the, the uh, if we want to uh, coin a term, the guardian of stability in, 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 in this region. You, you should know, Janusz, as good as it, I do. Think of this. The United States needs only three days to mobilize three million people, soldiers. And the European Union needs one month to mobilize 1,000 policemen to send them in a crisis area. You tell me now. S some, something is not right. <laughs> something is not right. <laughs> Well, let me ask you, I mean, as we're still on the subject of the European Union, it's difficult to get away because you're in Europe. Albania has aspirations to join the European Union. Will it join the European Union? Maybe start with you, George. And if so, when? Uh, that's the tough. The tough part of the question is the, is the last part. <laughs> I think Albania will join the European Union eventually one day. Albania, it's, uh, it's on track towards joining the European Union. Uh, Unfortunately, we, we're not seeing this uh, to move with the right pace that the Albanians would have wanted. And, and, uh, and I, I, I guess I can say that, and also in the right pace that they would have deserved it to develop. Uh, uh, but I think Albania is going towards that direction. Our trade partners are European member states, the, the most important ones. The, uh, uh, most of Albanian uh, workforce which, which emigrated in the last uh, two decades is also residing in Europe and it's sending remittance, remittances back. And, and, and there is a long list of very uh, uh, intensive relations with Albania and uh, the, the European Union member states and the Union as a whole. We receive financial assistance from the Union which is actually, if, if we would have listed the bilateral donors for the country and, and seeing the European Commission as one, uh, uh, this is the major bilateral donor, followed then by, 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 by Germany and then followed by United States of America in terms of financial aid to the country. So basically, there is, there is very good reasons for Albania to develop in its uh, so uh, you European think, integration. Yeah, I know phase. you have a different view, Fatou, so I'll come to you in a minute. I'll do but, that. But, <laughs> but, but do you think uh, Albania will qualify? Is there enough political will here in Tirana to meet the standards? I, I will answer very frankly. 
I think, and I don't understand this, if, if, if I would wake up in the middle of the night pretending that I'm not an Albanian and look at my country from above and say, like, what is wrong with these guys, you know? It's like our politicians seem to, to sometimes to have irrational fights with each other and that hampers their vision towards Europe in a sort of way which is unexplainable for a, for a non-Albanian audience. It's very difficultly, difficultly explainable. Uh, uh, said that, I guess uh, these political uh, 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 clashes that we've seen are, are a phenomena which can come and go for as long as there is the will of the Albanian uh, people to become uh, uh, European citizens one day. And this is a fact. I mean, all polls show that Albanians, the, the latest figures show that Albanians are 86% almost uh, uh, ready to join the European Union and mm -hmm. see themselves as European Union uh, uh, citizens one day. So whatever the politicians do, they can play as much as they want, but eventually they will go there one day if we uh, 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 are going to uh, take for granted the fact that Albania is a fully functioning democracy. Mm -hmm. Therefore, mm -hmm. the politicians will follow their people. And uh, we're going to break very briefly now for some adverts. We'll be back in a few minutes. Fatos, when will Albania join the European Union? When? I don't know. And I don't know if or whether it's going to join the European Union. Uh, we all wish. We wish actually we were a member of uh, the European Union, but unfortunately we are not. We don't know whether or not, and I'm sure we are not going to get the status of the candidate country uh, next month. Uh, even if we get it this year or next year, it will take another 15, 20 years maybe mm -hmm. until we become ready to become a member of the European Union. And by that time again, as I said, I don't know whether the European Union will exist in the form it is today or not. You know, what, what makes me sometimes wonder is the, the Soviet Union collapsed overnight. And nobody, nobody expected that to happen in 1999 or in the year 89 or in the year 1991. Uh, it was a very sudden collapse. And it was a much older state, 75 years. It was a much uh, more centralized economy, a command economy. Although all the ingredients were there if you looked under the surface. Yes, but they are also in the European Union. I don't think how Greece and Germany and Sweden can live together for, for much longer. Uh, and again, we didn't expect it happened. I believe that the European Union may quite well also collapse one night. Quite a sudden. Well, let me bring in another, you mentioned the Soviet Union. It's a nice segue into another political actor I want to introduce in the region. Russia. What is Russia's, what are Russia's objectives, let's say, particularly in this region, in the Balkans? I know uh, it, this is a, a very critical time in terms of Russia purchasing and expanding its energy infrastructure throughout Europe um, in order to monopolize uh, supplies, uh, to build pipelines that serve its financial and, and strategic interests. Is it something that Albania should be concerned about? Uh, is this something Albania can do to help, together with its neighbors, to help uh, guarantee its energy security and prevent hostile takeovers prevent the sort of strategic blackmail that Russia's engaged in towards its neighbors? How would you respond well, to that? Maybe Georgi as, as, yeah. a, as an economist. Yeah. Uh, I think this is a very, very interesting challenge that we're seeing. Uh, uh, the challenge of, of foreign policy played together with energy security, uh, uh, especially in our region. Like this is the, the crossroad of the Silk Road uh, uh, in terms of international trade now, it, it, uh, uh, the Balkans is also seen as a crowd road of, of gas and oil pipelines. Uh, we have three competing projects which are still open. We have the, the South Stream, we have Nabucco, and we have the trans Adriatic Pipeline. Uh, uh, actually, 2012 is a very important year for all three of these projects. Exactly. Towards the end of this year, we should be able to know what is the investor's decision, which of this is going to go further and which is not. And, and the answer to that question is very much linked to an influence of global players, in this case, mm -hmm. Russia and the United States, and also the European Union, which is actually the biggest, the biggest consumer of Russian oil, the, the whole union. Uh, uh, and therefore, we, we need, uh, actually, we, we have had to be careful about energy security a long time ago. 
this, this is the moment to see the fruits of that, of that uh, sort of uh, uh, stance, or if you want, the sort of uh, uh, careful analysis and, and, and prudent analysis. And, and it's very interesting because these days, actually, it's happening a very important privatization in this, in this concern in, in Albania. Al Petrol, it's, uh, it's the, 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 our national company, which is involved in oil extraction in the country. And uh, uh, together, uh, the company is being privatized, and the process uh, has started a few days ago. And we have seen, for my eyes, it was a very strange uh, 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 tendering procedure, actually, uh, given the results of it, because there was a huge difference between the lowest and the highest bidder in the tender, which does not have only economic justifications. Uh, uh, therefore. In itself, this exercise shows how important energy security mm -hmm. is also considered from the global players well, which are taking well, place in the race. Given that, should, and, should I'm sorry, yeah. maybe just briefly. Could, exactly. Yeah. And, and given the fact that uh, our neighbors mm -hmm. are also very much under, uh, have also been very much under this not only political influence of Russia and US, but also a little bit of fraternity if we, we, if we want to talk about the former Yugoslavia and Serbia and, and how Russia considers considers them, it, it has to be very, very carefully taken into consideration this kind of uh, uh, influence or, or uh, let's say, protectionism in the region, mm -hmm. but also in the focus of the uh, economic or energy interests. Right. Well, should, should, maybe I'll turn to Fato, should America be playing a more prominent role here? Sure, it, it should be playing that, such a role. Uh, but I would like to, to come back to, to, the, to Albania's role and its uh, mm -hmm. energy policy and to the role of Russia in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't seen any strategy or any policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis energy in Albania for the past 25 years. So I don't know what is our policy or our strategy. We don't have a strategy. We pretend to become or wanted to become a small superpower, energy superpower, and I don't know how. Plus, there's no small superpower. You are a superpower, you are not. Uh, <laughs> when it comes to Russia, uh, I, th I, I think Russia is coming back. The polar bear is coming back uh, very, very strongly indeed. And that is, I would like to blame actually, the policy of uh, the Obama administration, mm -hmm. which could have been more careful in, in its relation with Putin. Russia is strong again. Russia is dangerous again. Russia is unpredictable. Russia is taking advantage uh, of the Balkans. What happened in, 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 in Serbia, in uh, Central Asia, in Syria nowadays, in Iran, mm -hmm. all these hot spots have become Russia, made Russia a very, very important player, international player nowadays, especially if it's coupled, when you think how good it's coupled with uh, China. So both Russia and China are sabotating the role of the United States, and of course, Europe is almost nowhere. So Russia is to be uh, fearful, and Europe is fearful to that, because it has a command of its gas. Uh, in the Balkans, I don't think we're much aware about what role Russia can play. Right. But as I said, we do not have a, uh, energy policy or strategy in Albania to think of. And that, presumably that's something we can, Albania can work on with the United States, with its Western allies. Much better, much better than today. <clears throat> Let me turn now to, to a, a, another subject, which is directly US-Albania relations. What would you say are, are, are the priorities here? I mean, it's the 100th anniversary of Albanian statehood this year. Uh, what, are, what are the key issues here? What can still be developed? Is it business? Is it security? Is it, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the bilateral relationship, where can we help each other? Well, l let me say a few words here because I worked for four years in Washington and I worked on this bilateral relation. Uh, political relations are great. They've always been very good between Washington and Tehran since the, the diplomatic relation was established in, 90, in the 1992. Uh, diplomatic relations as well. Uh, trade relations are lacking. Uh, America would have been a much bigger uh, trade partner for us, and we also, for the United States, also a small, although a very small country, uh, cultural relations are almost non-existing. Mm. And so I, I, I can see how the best allies, the biggest allies, the most important country on, on Earth is not, in all these regards, Albania's best partner. So it's not only the support for, of the United States to join NATO, and you're right when you said that without the support of the United States and the United, United States Senate, Albania is not going to be a member even today. Uh, the support of the United States for Albania to join the European Union, it's there. It has always been there. Uh, the support of the United States to 
improve and strengthen and consolidate democracy in Albania, it's there. But there's no trade going on. There's no culture exchange. And that is what, what makes me real pessimistic when it comes. Economic deepening in the relationship, do you see that as a possibility? No. If that was the possibility, nothing was hampering it. It would have happened. This is not, uh, we do not have rules or regulations impeding Albanians to export to US and the other way around. To the contrary, we have rules or regulations stimulating that. It hasn't happened. So, and we come back to the beginning of this discussion. With Europe, we do not have very strong political relations. We have very intensive trade and cultural relations, right? Mm -hmm. So, it's, a, it's, it's important to see this to see this, uh, this uh, 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 let's say, combination of US and EU influence in the country. If we want to have a look at the external assistance of the United States, it, is, uh, uh, it has two major objectives. One, which is called rule of law and good governance, the USAID uh, uh, intervention in the country, which is not little. It's, it's, it, it has been between 15 and 20 million euros uh, a year. It's, it's, a, it's a substantial amount for a small economy and country like ours. Uh, and, and the second objective is economic growth. Now, uh, if we want, all this have to do with the macro development of the country, right? Uh, of course, economic growth, uh, USAID is also a very, very important and interesting mm -hmm. micro project. But overall, if we want to uh, generalize a little bit the, the focus, it, it has to do with the macro development of the country. And I think it will remain in those level of, of attention, even for the coming years. Given the, the, the distance between the two countries, given the different levels of development, given the, the uh, let's say, lack of technological development in the production of Albania, which actually it's a, it's a very important part in, in America's uh, uh, imports. But, but let me ask you, is, is Albania doing enough to attract American investors? Are there sectors that are still, uh, you know, there's a privatization program, for example, in energy. Uh, are there other areas in addition to energy where America could be more involved? America can be involved in all the sectors of the economy. It's, a, it's like it's the economic giant of the globe. Of course it can. Now, uh, uh, the thing is that it can be involved in these sectors if there is an interest to develop the sectors, or it can be involved because we want to invite it uh, uh, a specific, in a specific sense to build an incubator on a specific sector and, and say, like, United States will, okay, will take care of that. Mm -hmm. uh, this has not happened. As Professor Tarifa mentioned, we live in a country where we don't like strategies. We're, we're funny people, the Albanians. It's like you have come to know us now lately, but we don't like strategies. Even when we write them down, we just publicize them and we don't follow them later on. It's impressive to see the work of all Albanian governments in this last 20 years. They have produced and wasted so much paper on strategies because nothing has been followed afterwards. So we, we operate in a little bit of a, of a, of a very skeptical Fatos, way. Do you, do you agree, lack of strategy? <laughs> well, yeah, there's never been a strategy indeed. So go as it, as it comes. Uh, That's the strategy. Take it as it comes. <laughs> but, yeah. That's the strategy. Uh, no, it's not. It's, it's lack of strategy, it's lack of vision. Uh, but Jerzy is right. America is, is a giant, the, the, the global economic power, but we're not. And I don't know what is our economy and how can Americans be more involved. Uh, tourism would probably be uh, the, the main area of the economy in which they can, they can assist us. But we can have to assist ourselves, first of all. Uh, there's no other uh, area, no other sector of the economy, I think, that a giant such as the United States can really get seriously involved. Mm -hmm. uh, oil, maybe? Yes? But uh, let's see what's going to come after this uh, tender mm -hmm. in the next. Judge, any, any sectors that you would favor? I'm sorry, tourism, it's not, it's not going to be the sector where we're But there's no the agriculture States. and there's no, yeah. no building, construction industry. No. They're not going to come and construct our buildings. Yeah, definitely, but, but uh, we, have, we have damaged so much the environment with our, with our lack of uh, tourism development policies that is impossible now for an international company which wants to protect its brand internationally to come and work in such an environment where it's very, very host it will be hostilely attacked af afterwards. I mean, I, I take the advantage here to discuss about the lack of McDonald's in this country. There is not a McDonald's in this country. Well, that's and, good. And, that's good. And, 
and that's good. Depends okay. whether you like stop. McDonald's or not. <laughs> okay, <laughs> full stop. I can the only say good thing that's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the reason why it's not is because uh, there is so, so much lack of standards uh, uh, around and the, there is lack of rule of law and protection of patents and names that mm -hmm. it's, it's very... It, the international companies will have to have a, to take a huge risk for such a small market, and they will not do it on their own. It doesn't make e economic sense for them. So basically, they have, so basically, they have, they have right? to be they have for, to be uh, 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 promoted to do so yeah. in a sort of formal shape. But I, I want to come back to the to the very interesting discussion we were having beforehand with the energy security of the region and with the potential involvement of of uh, asking actually for the Albanian government asking the United States to be involved in this sector. I think that would have been a very smart move. I think, I think if, if the, the, the Albanian government would have decided to do so, that would have been a very smart move in many perspectives. It would have given our country a little, a better position in the region. Uh, uh, it would have given Kosovo a much comforting uh, 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 position for its uh, development. Uh, uh, it would have uh, re-brought Albania uh, in the agenda in many offices in Washington DC, not only in, in the, in the, in the uh, Department of State, mm -hmm. but, but in, 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 many, in many other yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, departments in the United States. It would, have, it would have helped European Union in itself, because it would have given the big ally a place to put its finger in the Balkans, and given our previous discussion that this is a trade route mm -hmm. for oil and gas, this, this would have been important for the European Union as, mm -hmm. uh, it, itself. It would have been important for the United States to be here, and it would have been important to, to, to let's, uh, let's say, to, to uh, sort of uh, block the Russian influence in expanding in the Balkans. I think that would have been a, a very good combination of good factors if one would have thought of. Uh, uh, we, will, we will see how... Uh, so again, lack, this, of, lack of strategy. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, let's see if there is one this time. <laughs> well, when you have a lack, uh, nature bores a vacuum, you right. have to develop a strategy. Right. In fact, let me ask another question about US-Albanian relations. I've heard this from some people, uh, and again, it, I, it depends which way you look at it. Does America interfere too much in the domestic political scene here, or not enough? Or is it just the right balance? You as a former ambassador, I don't know how much you interfered in American politics, but as a former ambassador, I well, think I you, have a feel. <laughs> <laughs> you have a feel for this. Uh, well, well how, would you, how would you respond to that? There is much talk about that nowadays, especially when it comes to the role of the US ambassador mm -hmm. uh, in, in Albania's politics, domestic politics. Uh, it also depends how you look at that. You know, what is interference and how much or, or how little interference there is. I think America has a role to play, and it's playing that role in Albania. It played that with the first visit of Jim Baker, mm -hmm. and every single American ambassador has done the same. Right. So I, I don't see a difference in that regard. Uh, it's it's a, the, the, the democracy of the world. It's, it's a, the most powerful country, and it has a representative here. So it has to play a role. Otherwise, why are those relationships? Uh, I think America uh, plays a role, and we perceive that as such, as if America is somehow obligated. Uh, to, to, do, to do that. You see, even a low-level official from Washington is received in Tirana by its politicians and also by the public uh, with, uh, as a much more important event than a high official from Brussels. It shows how much of leverage you know, Americans have among us. Uh, the problem is what kind of interference it is or what kind of help or assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, people need to see more openness, more transparency. What are the United States talking about our politicians? What are the messages they are conveying to us? This is what is important among the public. Uh, if, if we don't say that, then there is anecdotes in the streets. You know? And also there is something else that I've noticed in, in the past few years. Every single Albanian politician has an interest to have good personal relationship with the US ambassador, when claiming it as his, his friend. And I remember all prime ministers that I've, been, I've known since 1998 used to say, the late Lim Brady is my friend, or Ambassador Jeffrey is my friend, or Marcio Rice is my friend, or the next ambassador is my friend. That kind of personal relation helps them, but it doesn't help politics. Georgi, any view on this? I, I think there is room for, for developments there. I, I, I mean, my opinion in this sense is pretty humble because I haven't served as Ambassador mm -hmm. Tarifa and, and I, I'm not that much of an expert of foreign policy. But I'm a, an attentive Albanian living in my country. Mm -hmm. and, 
And I fully share the observations of, of Professor Tarifa. And I think uh, these observations uh, make, should make the life difficult for any American ambassador. The fact that it's so much wanted, the fact that it's so much uh, friendship with him is abused by local politicians, mm -hmm. if you want, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think the best, the best thing to do in this sense is to ally with the Albanians. Uh, the Albanian people, they, they love the United States. It's, it's, it's something, it's, for them, is uncontestable. Whoever will try to tell them that, uh, listen, this time the United States is trying to fool you, they will say, no, we don't believe this. Whatever it's true or not, we don't mm -hmm. believe it. So this is important. Uh, what to do with that? Uh, work with civil society, which actually it's working with the people. Uh, if I uh, would, have, would have had the opportunity to use this instrument, the foreign policy or the presence of an embassy in the country, I would not have used it by meeting both sides politicians and uh, giving mixed uh, signals to the people about what I talked to them, because this is actually what this situation mm -hmm. turns into afterwards because you want to be friends with everybody, you don't want to hurt everybody, uh, anybody, you don't want to pretend that you're telling the Prime Minister or the opposition what to do and what not. That's, that's not a comforting situation. I think a very comforting situation is for any U.S. ambassador to talk to Albanian students, to, to, to go to meet Albanian farmers and, and talk to Albanian people which actually does not always have to happen in Tirana. And this is a good thing, actually. The American ambassador travels around a lot. All, all of them do in the country. As they but I would, have, I, would have, I would have wanted to see them a bit more involved with civil society, with, with investing in civil society. Mm -hmm. I think what has been lacking in these 20 years of development of my country, uh, transitioning towards a functioning market economy, it's a strong civil society. It's, mm -hmm. it's not there yet. And that's the reason why, as you mentioned before, we have politicians playing with European integration, which is the future of their people. Because there is not this, uh, let's say, uh, 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 group uh, mm -hmm. of people standing together and saying which are the values of the Albanian people, which politicians cannot play with, mm -hmm. and which are part of their electoral discussion. We're coming to the end of our, of our time, only a couple of minutes. Maybe a last question I have for both of you. Albanians watch America very closely, United States very closely. We have an important event in a couple of months, which is the presidential elections. Is it going to make any difference who wins in terms of U.S. policy towards Albania? Fatos? Uh, not at all. I don't think change in the Oval Office brings change in American foreign policy. So whoever occupies that office is not going to change or make any dramatic change towards policies towards uh, one particular country or on global affairs. So what Bill Clinton did or George Bush, most recent president of Barack Obama, is going to be basically the same foreign policy. What they are interested in the Balkans is peace, stability, progress, uh, European integration, mm -hmm. and none of this is going to change whoever occupies that office. So, no. Judge, do you agree? Fully. Fully agree. It, uh, it is not important. Uh, we will continue to consider the United States as a very important uh, partner, and uh, I think the United States will also continue to consider Albania a very important partner as well. Okay. Maybe on that note, <laughs> we will finish, and I'm sure we'll be back again. These are very important questions that I think you've covered in a very, let's say, lively way. And I'm always glad when there's some differences of opinion. It makes the conversation much more interesting. Thank you both for coming, for your comments and for analysis. I'm sure we'll have you back in the future. <laughs> and uh, we're going to break very briefly now for some adverts. We'll be back in a few minutes. My second commentary on a major regional topic focuses on Kosovo's new era. Kosovo's parliament has recently approved changes to the country's constitution to terminate international supervision. However, such legal amendments will not resolve Kosovo's two outstanding problems, poor relations with Serbia and the threat of territorial partition. Kosovo's constitutional amendments will replace the competencies of the international civilian representative established to oversee the new state when it gained independence in 2008. It will not affect the status of NATO or the presence of the ULEX rule of law mission. However, none of these institutional arrangements have dealt with the most persistent obstacle to regional security, negative relations between Serbia and Kosovo. 
Despite American and EU involvement, talks between Belgrade and Pristina have only achieved very limited progress. The partition of Kosovo is not the Serbian government's official policy, but there are strong indications that this is Belgrade's ultimate objective. Serbia's promotion of partition is based on the realization that it cannot regain the entire country and the assumption that the EU is weak without intense American involvement. It may also be counting on potential Russian support for secession. To break the diplomatic deadlock, Kosovo's Deputy Prime Minister recently announced a bold proposal for a peace treaty with Serbia. Although his idea seems naive, the political impact of seeking such an agreement can prove positive. Above all, it will demonstrate that the new state is finally taking the diplomatic offensive. While Prime Minister Hashim Tachi has spent the past year justifying the EU-sponsored dialogue, Belgrade has devoted most of its foreign policy diplomacy to preventing Kosovo's membership in the United Nations and in other major international institutions. Of course, Belgrade will not sign any treaty with a state that it does not recognize, but its refusal can also prove beneficial for Kosovo for three reasons. First, Pristina can highlight its own desire for normal bilateral relations without any territorial claims and in line with EU and US objectives. A treaty will help place the bilateral dialogue on technical and practical issues on more solid foundations. Second, moves towards a peace treaty can be a precedent for other Balkan countries that remain stuck in persistent bilateral disputes. And third, the call for a peace treaty will focus attention on Belgrade's intentions in the region. Until now, Serbian officials have depicted Kosovo as an unstable territory that generates regional insecurity. If Pristina reaches out for a comprehensive peace agreement, Serbia's rejection will simply spotlight its own deficiencies and its regional aspirations. I will turn now to our studio audience for questions and answers about politics and world affairs. What is in the minds of Albanian citizens? And today we have students and professors from Epoca University. Welcome to the show. Looking forward to your questions. Please, who is first? Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Reina Zanelai, and I'm a lecturer at Epoca University at the Department of Political Science and International Relations. My question is certainly about U.S. Uh, influencing power in the region. Well, we know that European Union has generally applied the soft power, maybe due to its lack of military power. And USA is prominent about its hard power, right? So, uh, but our, the last statement of Romney that our family is more important uh, has, brings me some doubts whether USA will change its policy from hard power to soft power in the Balkan regions, more specifically, but in the world as well. Yeah, I don't agree that, that there's a division somehow between the US and the EU in terms of hard and soft power. Uh, of course, in terms of hard power, America is key because it leads NATO, uh, because it can mobilize troops and resources much more quickly than, than Europe can. However, the United States also has a soft power uh, capability, which it deploys, I think, has deployed very successfully around the world. And of course, programs such as democracy promotion, good government, building civil societies, you know, in all these aspects, America has been, I would say, at the forefront of soft power. I remember when I first came to Albania 20-something years ago, uh, it was part of a, a, a soft power policy to promote democracy in this country. I didn't see the European Union anywhere, but America was involved very early on in this country. So I don't think America is going to withdraw from its hard power role to such a degree that it won't be able to respond if there's a major crisis. But I think it will continue to play a role in, in soft power to complement the European Union integration process. Uh, but also because of the close links between Albania and America, I think America will remain very important in several of these soft power uh, uh, dimensions that, that you mentioned. Please. 
Good evening. Uh, my name is Elisa Gonzalez. I'm a master's student of Epoca University. Speak a bit louder, sorry. Okay. Uh, I am a master's student and of uh, the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Epoca University. And I will ask if uh, um, a closer relation between uh, United States of America and Albania uh, could be uh, a guarantee for the integrity of the country. Uh, for the what of the country? Integrity. Integrity. Of the country. Uh, regarding the grid issue or uh, another issue uh, within the, re the region and if uh, uh, most of all about uh, the political dimension of these issues. Sure. I, I, I mean, I don't think the premise of your question is that Albanian integrity is somehow under threat. I, I don't think that's the case. There are several countries in the Balkan region where the inter territorial integrity of the country in question is in question. I don't think that's the case in Albania. Uh, let, let me sort of step back a little bit. I think you're talking about the Albanian-Greek maritime dispute and other questions. There are many cases, there have been many cases uh, from in the former communist world where disputes that were never resolved after the Second World War have come to the forefront after these countries regained their independence and started to build democracies. <coughs> A good example, for, ex uh, for instance, was the uh, Polish-German dispute over the Odenisa line, which was finally settled uh, after Poland came out of communism. A treaty was signed with Germany. Questions between the Czechs, for example, and the Germans over the Sudetenland. In this region, for example, there's been, if not a dispute, some question between Italy and Slovenia over borders. Most recently between Croatia and Slovenia over maritime demarcations. So these questions are still there. They, they won't lead to a conflict. They won't lead, I don't think, to any kind of territorial threat to territorial partition. Uh, but I think it, it would show the maturity of both governments to resolve these questions in a, in a let's say, in a bilateral format in a way that, that, that will lead to some sort of compromise that will be beneficial for both sides. And I probably think that that's what will happen unless the temperature somehow is raised by other factors. So I don't see a threat uh, and I don't see a sufficient threat for the US to be involved in such a dispute. Please, who's next? My name is Gloria Ashkurti and I'm a student at Epoca University. My question was regarding the tender of, uh, the pr for the private privatization of Alpetrol and uh, when the later was uh, sold to an American company. And following this, can we expect an increase of direct investments from America to our country? I think any kind of American investment in Albania is beneficial. Uh, to both sides, particularly if the conditions are, are right for an investor, whether a medium sized or a large investor, to come in uh, and to be able to uh, make a profit. I think it would be beneficial both to the American side, but also beneficial to Albania. The experience uh, that American companies bring to Albania, I think, would be beneficial. Uh, I think particularly in the energy sector, where there is concern about energy security, not just here, but throughout the Balkans, uh, particularly when we look at Russian policy in the region, uh, the, the uncertainties about the future of South Stream and TAP and Nabucco and so forth. I think it's important for Albania to be involved in the development of a proper energy security strategy. And in this sense, it's important to have, I think, uh, American investors. But in other areas as well, infrastructure, tourism, I mean, there's, there's, there's a number of areas where I think there could be more effort by the Albanian side to attract foreign investors, particularly American investors. And this will have a, a, a beneficial role, I think, in bilateral relations, obviously, as well, because it will strengthen that uh, U.S.-Albanian relationship, not just in grand theory and history, but in practice, in very practical terms. Please. My name is Emira Nahuti. I'm a third year student of, at Epoca University. Mm -hmm. So if Greece is out of Eurozone, what is the impact on Albanian's economy? If Greece is out of the Eurozone, it's a big if. Uh, the question may be decided over the coming months as Greece is trying to get the last tranche of this uh, uh, Troika aid package, uh, so-called bailout, uh, in order to be able to pay its, its, uh, its, sal its salaries, its, uh, all the obligations of the state. Now, if Greece for some reason were to default, 
that it couldn't save the money that, that is required by the European Union, it doesn't get the next tranche of, of the international assistance, and basically it becomes bankrupt, then it defaults and leaves, presumably leaves the Eurozone. There's no mechanism actually for leaving the Eurozone, but it would come, economists I've spoken to say it will come regardless of the fact that, that there is no mechanism. Impact on Albania, to answer your question, uh, negative. I mean, the impact clearly be negative in all countries in the region, not to mention the Eurozone as a whole, uh, for several reasons. One, we don't know what the spillover effect will be, how it will affect other countries that are some, uh, suffering also with huge debts, huge sovereign debts, Italy, Spain, and so on and so forth. In terms of directly Albania, you will find that a massive drop in living standards in Greece will mean that many of the Albanian workers uh, will come home or we'll try and go elsewhere in Europe uh, to earn the same amount of money. It won't be worthwhile, in other words, for them to work in Greece because the remittances will drop through the floor. Uh, so that'll put pressure on the Albanian economy and on the infrastructure if you have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of Albanians who are coming home. Secondly, the impact on banks, Greek banks in this country. Uh, that has to be borne in mind very, very closely. Thirdly, I would say trade, obviously. Um, so in terms of also the future of the monetary union, uh, which will come under increasing question, already some countries that were on track to the monetary union are having second thoughts, Bulgaria the most recent. So it, it, will, it will introduce a new equation into the European integration process. And Albania will be looking very closely at which way Europe is heading as a result of this crisis. So there are immediate factors and the sort of bigger picture that Albania has to bear in mind. Please. My name is Ravena Tujani. I'm a master's student at the Poca University, Department of Political Science and International Relations. I would like to say that according to a survey that we have conducted at the Poca University about Albania precipitation on foreign policy, there is a huge wish and expectation of united Albania and Kosovo and in Albania public. So in terms of conflict resolution, how does U.S. deal with this uh, expectation? Expectate, if I heard you correctly, expectation of a union between Kosovo and Albania. Yeah, I've, I've heard this actually from some people, not, not that many, but I've heard this talked about. Uh, it's something I think at this stage is going to be very destabilizing. In other words, any moves by Kosovo, which not, hasn't yet entered international institutions, the major ones, United Nations and so forth, is still not recognized by the entire European Union, faces its own internal problems with potential partition in the north of the country. I think any such moves are going to alienate the international community, uh, put pressure on Kosovo, uh, maybe even restore some sort of international supervision over the country. It will also, uh, let's say, encourage other separatist and uh, irredentist forces throughout the Balkans to aim to capture other territories that they claim are theirs historically. It will also place Albania in a very difficult position because Albania up until now has behaved extremely responsibly in the region in terms of not promoting pan-Albanianism or ethnic Albania, but, but focusing on its own borders and its own development. If it's drawn into this uh, national uh, enlargement struggle in the region, uh, it's going to have a lot of negative publicity and a lot of of negative impact in terms of its own progress towards the European Union and I would say even its relations with the United States would suffer. So I can't see political leaders on either side pushing such an agenda. But who knows in 10, 20 years who's going to be in power at that time, what the public mood is going to be, what the shape of the European Union will be. For the foreseeable future, I do not think it's a good idea to push for such an agenda. Please. My name is Dr. Salih Özcan. I am the head of the Department of Political Science. Now, I would like to ask about the America's policies interest in the region. As you mentioned earlier, there is a close relation between America and Albania. So in this regard, in terms of America's priorities, are they similar with the Albanian priorities in the Balkan region? And is there any conflict between America's priorities and also EU ones? Two questions there. No, I don't see any difference between 
US and Albanian priorities towards the region. I think the Albanian authorities, or let's say the Albanian political elite of all parties know what is expected of them and what is best for the country. In other words, to meet all the criteria qualifications to move into the European Union, which would benefit, presumably will benefit the entire population, although the future of the European Union itself is now under debate. Uh, and I think there's no difference between the US and the EU in terms of stability in the region, maintaining current borders, not opening up a Pandora's box of separatism, uh, making sure that there are no major outstanding bilateral disputes in the region, and of course democratic progress, building the institutions, building the political culture, building a, a, a proper competitive non-corrupt market economy. All these are beneficial for Albania and, and and all these factors, I think, are agreed upon between Washington and Brussels. I don't see any, there may be some slight differences of approach towards other countries, but in terms of Albania's progress, uh, I don't see any difference. Anybody else? Yeah, <clears throat> good evening. My name is Dr. Bekir Chiner. I'm a lecturer at Epoca University. My question is a little bit different than the previously being asked. It seemed to me that the economic transitions and democratic transition of Albania is in the right directions and is improving and developing. That's very good. But at the same time, then now the Middle East crisis is in getting intense and possibly due to the American elections, more likely that after the elections, we may see f further developments. It seemed to me that that development going to affect Albania in particular, and in Balkan region in general, what kind of impact and the developments relation to the in Middle East developments to Balkans region you foresee? Yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting question, but there's too many hypotheticals uh, involved. If you're talking about U.S. involvement in the Middle East, there are so many parts of the Middle East where the U.S. is involved in different ways. Uh, for example, our presence in the Gulf, our presence in Saudi Arabia and so forth is very different to our presence in countries such as Syria or, or now Iraq where there's been an American withdrawal. I, I presume if you mean a, a crisis, the biggest potential crisis I see is some kind of a war over Iran. Um, not necessarily provoked by America, but it could be an Israeli and Iranian conflict in which America could be drawn in or its uh, troops and equipment in the region will be affected by a, a, a Iranian reaction. How that will affect the Balkans, it, it's, it's difficult to speculate. We're not heavily involved militarily here. There is a small mission now in Kosovo under K4, NATO mission, which I think will remain and maybe scaled down a little bit. This, this region does not face a major danger of armed conflict, I would say. It's a very different picture to 20 years ago. What it does face is, is, is a, a, a conflict, I would say political conflict, and insufficient, let's say, willpower and motivation to continue and complete the reform process. And that's not something that America can, let's say, decide. It's not something that, 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 that America can send in troops and resolve. This is a, a, a let's say, a, it, it's an internal, domestic, regional question. The only danger I would see is if some of these scenarios that you paint of moves towards unification, partition, if that was to get out of control and the European Union wasn't able to handle it, if there was a crisis in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Macedonia simultaneously, then there could be a possibility of, of a call to America uh, the Seventh Cavalry, if you like, to, to come back in to save the day. Um, hopefully that's not going to happen, and hopefully there's sufficient maturity and sense of self-interest in these countries to prevent the situation from escalating again out of control. So in that sense, I don't think Middle East is going to affect directly the situation in the Balkans. Please. I have one last question mm -hmm. about European Union this time. In the middle of this crisis, in which our neighbors are mostly affected, like Italy and Greece, what is this great enthusiasm of Albanians to be part of it? And if you were an Albanian, would you feel the same? 
If I was in Albania, yes, uh, I would want to be part of the European Union because I think the benefits outweigh, for the time being at least, who knows for the future, I think the benefits outweigh the costs. Also, you're talking about countries that are in the monetary union and there are countries that are in the European Union who aren't in a monetary union, but they're not clamoring to get out the European Union. They just don't want to get into the monetary union because of the fact that it's, uh, it seems to be unworkable without a more integrated fiscal union. Uh, I would say the benefits for Albania to be in the European Union are greater than it being outside. And secondly, equally if not more important, the reforms that have to be conducted in order to qualify are beneficial for Albania regardless of whether it joins. Okay, I think we've finished there. Unfortunately, we have already come to the end of the show. I've greatly enjoyed being with you and, of course, with my colleagues here at Albanian Screen. Good night, everyone. Stay healthy, be productive, and remain optimistic, and see you all very soon. Miro Pavshim.